So we were talking about uh, bone injuries, and uh, I think we finished right before this particular case. So, uh, see, Ashley, why don't you take this case? Look, there's a lot, a lot of uh, edema within the uh, proximal aspect of the second metatarsal. I, I would, you know, this is a 15-year-old ballerina. Um, we'd be worried about a stress fracture here. Yeah. Yeah, so this is just a metatarsal stress fracture. And the second metatarsal is a common area for these kind of stress injuries in people like this. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? Um, so this looks like a pediatric patient. You can see the physes are open, um, and it looks like there's a, a subtle edema around the physis. And I'd want to look at additional images, and there's also some edema. It looks like in the distal navicular. Okay. So this could reflect a stress injury of the navicular. Yeah. So so this is a normal kind of signal that you see around a normal epiphysis. Uh, in the distal tibia. So that's normal. But what we see here is uh, bone marrow edema within the uh, navicular. And uh, this is due to trauma. And if you continue to have repetitive trauma on this, then you can end up with collapse of the navicular. It's called Kohler's disease. Uh, okay, uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? Okay, so radiographs of the foot. Um, so the navicular, um, the talus and the navicular are both abnormal at their articulation. There's like marked flattening of the talus and as well as there's flattening and sclerosis involving the navicular. So I don't know if this is just like progressed. Uh, uh, so, so in adults, this is osteonecrosis. Well, it's not osteonecrosis. That's what people say it is. But uh, I, I don't think that's the proper term for this. Uh, it's called a Mueller Weiss syndrome in adults. Uh, this is really a uh, 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 traumatic injury to the to the navicular, where you just get compression and uh, fracturing of the, of the navicular bone. It's not primarily due to loss of vascular supply. This is due to the repetitive trauma uh, that that's left unchecked. Uh, so, so, so this is one case which we see here. Uh, Ashley, what do you think about this case? This looks very similar. Um, there's a lot of sclerosis of the navicular. There's kind of it, 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 it kind of thins out along the lateral aspect of the navicular. Um, uh, yeah, I think there might even be some fragmentation there. I don't know. This this looks like a, another case of Mueller Weiss syndrome. Yeah, so this one's a little bit more severe than the prior one. It's really due to repetitive stress injuries. And, and, and you've got to recognize that that's the pathophysiology that's occurring here. Uh, uh, so uh, this, again, Mueller-Weiss syndrome or uh, repetitive trauma. And you can see different stages of the disease as you get more and severe, more, and more severe injury uh, to the navicular bone. That's typically how it progresses. Okay, uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? Okay, so here along the distal talus, there's a lot of fluid signal intensity, cortical irregularity, and near complete absence of the navicular with some osseous fragments present. I would think this is an advanced case of Mueller-Weiss syndrome. Yeah, you can see severe, uh, severe injury and and uh, this is, you're right, uh, a more severe form of Mueller Weiss, where even the medial aspect of, of the navicular has been uh, impacted. Okay. Uh, Michael, what do you think of this one? Michael? Sorry, I was still muted. Uh, we see significant edema in the um, middle uh, cuneiform. Yeah. Um, it doesn't look like, I don't think there's like collapse yet at this point. Okay, good. Um, so it's kind of like 
you know, maybe, and there's like, a, there might be a cortical fracture. Yeah, it's hard to see. Listen, you're right, there may be, but this is primarily a diffuse trabecular bone injury of the lateral cuneiform. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And in this case, I don't think that there was any significant collapse, but again, it's a trabecular bone injury. Yeah, sorry, lateral cuneiform. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ashley, what do you think of this? was a 16 year old, very tall male uh, who had pain in his in his foot after playing volleyball for his high school team. Uh, on a 16, uh, so it looks like at three weeks, there's significant trabecular injury of the cuboid, especially along the plantar surface. At five weeks, looks a little better, maybe. Okay, so he was the, uh, uh, let's see, well, he was the son of the sister of an orthopedic surgeon. So we got quite a few studies on him. And you can see these, and he supposedly was not uh, putting I was not doing athletic activity at this time. I think he was putting full weight bearing on his foot, but he was not supposedly playing ball. But you can see that these can be very delayed in their ability to heal. We usually think that most fractures heal within about six weeks, but you can have significant delay in healing of these uh, trabecular fractures. And this is funny what it looked like a year later when he finally, he was very symptomatic for, I think, up to, I think it was up to six months uh, before he was really able to go back to athletic activity. And here we can see him one year out where it looks like it's healed. So this is really a trabecular bone injury of the uh, of the cuboid. And just realize that sometimes these can take a long time to heal. It can be very frustrating. Do you think also it was delayed because of the uh, the fact that he was still weight-bearing? Uh, my, guess, my guess is that's the case. And, and I'm also kind of curious that I think a lot of that also might well have been or is commonly the case where these teenagers will go back and do athletic activity and not tell their parents uh, as well. 16 years old. Uh, 16 year olds don't listen to their parents. <laughs> right. So um, my guess a lot of the delay is is uh, using but but uh, they swear that he didn't uh, so well, uh, uh, I, I don't know who he swore to. <laughs> he swore to his parents, but uh, I have the feeling that uh, John is skeptical of the history. Uh, slightly. <laughs> okay. No, usually these uh, should heal within six to eight weeks, um, even though it's a foot. Uh, it still should, should heal within that time. Uh, this this is not like a, a fracture that's collapsed, right? Uh, and then as a, a abnormal stress is put on it. This is a uh, just a. I guess you do pro probably have some some uh, fractures of uh, uh, of the cancel his bone, but uh, certainly not enough to cause uh, a deformity. Okay. So that should heal. Right. Well, it eventually did, but it... Uh, it well, he should have been in crutches. Yeah. I think uh, uh, he should have been on crutches. Uh, yeah. uh, that would have got things uh, going faster. Right. Uh, if we give him a benefit of a doubt. Okay, great. Jennifer, what do you think of this case? Um, so we can see a lot of edema in the medial and probably middle cuneiform, which I can't see as well on this image, but it almost looks like there's some, some proximal migration of that second metatarsal. I'd be concerned about a Liz Frank yeah. Injury. So the Lisfranc ligament would be right here. And then this is kind of a normal position of the base of the second. It actually normally is considerably proximal to the base of the first. And this is right where the Lisfranc ligament would be. But I would be very concerned about the Lisfranc ligament. This is right in the area where you get the injury that, that can lead to a lot of uh, de deformity and long term pain uh, with a Lisfranc fr uh, ligament. Injury. I don't see actual lateral displacement uh, between the medial cuneiform and the second metatarsal base, but I also don't see a nice, good black 
uh, Lis Frank ligament either. And this was a series of midfoot fractures, but this is one that you'd have to be very concerned about and watch very closely if you don't operate. Okay, uh, Michael? Okay, so there's um, quite a bit of edema in that uh, distal fibula. And I'm wondering, I can't tell if that's like a bone fragment distally. Yeah, so or this, if I'm being fit. What were that's the, like that's a fracture, correct? Right. Like a transverse fracture through so, the fibula. So what's the mechanism of injury here? Um, I mean, they like rolled their ankle, so you could have like a uh, inversion injury. Right. Inversion injury. Yeah, and so you look to see impaction on the medial side, which we don't see. I don't see it on this cut, but um, yeah. So that's an avulsion fracture. Great. All right, uh, Ashu. Um, this is a young patient. Um, uh, you can see some periosteal reaction and edema at the metaphysis of the distal tibia. It's kind of like a torus fracture. Yep, good. So these, these kids can have these kind of special fractures where you really just get buckling of the cortex. And this, like we saw the torus fracture in the uh, metatarsal Last time, this is a really a torus fracture of the distal tibia. Jennifer? Okay, so again, we have a pediatric patient. We can see the physes are open. Um, it looks like there is some edema in the medial malleolus with a, could be a small ossific fragment there. Yep. This is probably an eversion mechanism of injury. Right, exactly. A little bit of avulsion fracture here, the medial malleolus. Okay, Michael. Okay, so we see some edema in the distal fibula with a kind of mildly displaced little fragment, yeah. kind of anterior distally. That actually looks somewhat corticated, though. Um, but I guess there's probably you know avulsion fracture. Yeah, so this is a very typical avulsion fracture. It's really from the distal fibula at the attachment of the anterior talofibular ligament. And so that's a pretty common type fracture that you can see in the, in the ankle. Okay. Uh, and here's another example of a similar avulsion fracture here, and you can see the little os here. These are called os fibularies in, in some of the literature in Keats' textbook. Some people consider these as being normal variants, but I think virtually all of these are old avulsion uh, injuries or uh, intraosseous ossicles that develop due to injuries of the anterior talofibular ligament there at the bony, uh, bony attachment. Okay, Ashu. 24-year-old um, male with right foot pain. Um, looking at this. Um, Sorry, one sec. Um, it looks like the navicular looks a little abnormal along the on the, the medial aspect right there, maybe? I don't, I don't know. Um, oh, okay, so this is a type 2 osnavicular, and it's uh, and there's a lot of narrow edema along the syndicate. So this is a this is a symptomatic type 2 osnavicular. It's a good, good. Here we can see the edema there. So uh, you can see these quite commonly, and we already know the types one, two, and three. So I won't spend a lot of time on going through the, the different appearances. And this would be the type three, where you have a cornuate type, and this would be a this is a, a recent fracture of a, of the type three. Okay, and I think this was a, uh, um, um, yeah, uh, th th this was actually a professional hockey player who was hit on the medial side of the uh, foot by a puck and has a little fracture there of what's probably a type three uh, cornuate type navicular uh, little fracture there that healed pretty readily. And this is another a professional hockey player. What do you think of this case, uh, Jennifer? 
Okay, so he was hit by a puck. I don't see if, uh, well, on the lateral foot, there may be some slight cortical irregularity along the lateral aspect of the calcaneus, but I would want to see the additional views as well. And there's slight irregularity where the, where the arrow is. I don't see a discrete fracture there. That's where the that's where the puck hit the foot. And here's the okay. arrow scan. Okay, so here it does look like there is a non-displaced fracture. Yeah. So so here are two edema. fractures of the medial aspect of the navicular, both in hockey players from a direct trauma from uh, puck. And here we can see a lot of edema, soft tissue edema, as well as bone edema, and a little bit of a comminuted fracture. And there's the fracture fragment on the CT scan a few weeks later. And then here is healing about five, five uh, months later with healing with a little bit of irregularity, but he was not symptomatic at this time. They just wanted to redo the CT scan just to document that it healed. Okay, Michael, what do you think of this case? Okay, um, so we see, you know, marked edema on the stir sequences and marked decreased T1 signal on that part of the navicular, and it looks like there might be uh, like a fracture line right there where it demarcates. Um, well, uh, so so here, this is the anterior process. And it does look like, yeah, what's what's abnormal though is, I don't know if there's like abnormal kind of configuration of the anterior calcaneus as well. Like if we're getting into, like what's the, like the history? Like if there's like a coalition here going on? Yeah. So, so, like, it doesn't look bony, but yeah. So, so this is a patient who has edema in the prominent uh, 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 aspect of the lateral aspect of the navicular and the anterior process of the calcaneus. And this patient had a fibrous coalition here, and that produced abnormal yeah. stress pattern. And the typical, very sharp, looks a little bit more chronic-like because of the sharp edges, edema mm -hmm. within the bone due to the stress pattern of the bone. And this is yep. from a fibrous coalition. And, and this is a very common location for fibrous coalitions within the ankle. Okay. And then here we can see a comminuted posterior malleolar fracture in this patient. Uh, chronic ankle pain, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Um, the hibernation uh, along the posterior tibial plafond there, um, a little bit of marrow edema. Um, I don't see that much instability there. I think the cartilage actually is okay. Um, this might be just a, you know, just, yeah, an old trauma. Yeah, so this is just old trauma. And it's probably, this is probably early on, the early development of osteoarthrosis as you go forward, which is due to post-traumatic, right? Uh, solid case here. Jennifer, what do you think is going on here? <laughs> so there's vertically oriented fracture of the talus, um, and there's also surrounding edema and some edema in the superior calcaneus, which probably reflects osseous contusion. Yeah. And here again, we can see the fracture of the talus it's minimally displaced i think i call that body of the talus yeah good yeah so it's really kind of a, a fracture of the body of the talus really in the coronal plane which does involve a little bit of the anterior uh articulating surface here of the of the taylor dome and we can see some other little bony contusions around it as well So it gets us to the area of the, of the mortise joint. And uh, here is a polytomogram of the mortise joint, an old fashioned CT scan of the mortise joint with reconstructions. And here we can see a cystic lesion involving the medial margin of the talus. You're all familiar with, with these injuries of the talus, but that's a, that's a typical uh, kind of chronic post-traumatic cyst involving the subchondral bone. And these occur quite commonly on both the medial and lateral aspect of the talus. And these are due to inversion and eversion injuries, as I, I think you're all 
uh, pretty well aware. Now, uh, injuries in this location have uh, uh, were described in 1959 by uh, Berndt and Hardy, and they have a classification system which a lot of people still use. Uh, if you just involve the subchondral bone but the cartilage is okay, that's a type 1. Partially detached fragments are type 2. And saturated detached fragment is type 3. And then a dislodged fragment really was a, is a type 4. And this is just kind of example. With MR and a type 1, we just see subchondral bone marrow edema with intact cartilage. A type 2, we can see a little bit of a fracture line with involvement of the cartilage in one location. Here's a type 3 where the cartilage is involved in two locations, and then you have a displaced fragment with a type 4. Again, I, I, don't, I don't give these different stages in my report. I just describe the findings, but you know what to look for. A more recent description is from comes from arthroscopy from a Mintz article where they look at the stages, and this is uh, after the development of uh, MR. Uh, type stage, you have normal cartilage at uh, stage one of intact, but the cartilage is abnormal by arthroscopy or by MR. Uh, uh, stage two is fibrillation, but it doesn't go all the way down to the bone. Three is where you actually see the bone, the bone exposed. Four, you have an undisplaced fragment, and then a five is a displaced fragment. Again, these are things you need to look for, but I would actually describe the findings and, and not put the stages because obviously. This staging is different from the Brent Hardy classification. So if you just say a stage two, it may mean different things to different people. And here's an MRI classification in skeletal radiology in 2012, where they go through a, no, a number of different uh, patterns. <laughs> Again, I, I really kind of describe the, the findings, and, and I don't really give it uh, a grade in the reports. So uh, this was a uh, very early study of MR, I think, back in the late 1980s. Uh, when we first had MR, we had this was before we had fat-suppressed type imaging. Here on the T1-weighted image, we can see ex extensive signal loss on the T1-weighted images due to all the water that's uh, in, in the fat. If we On the T2-weighted images, we can see some subchondral regularity. Uh, in this particular uh, patient. So th this we thought was a, a, an early tailored dome injury where you just have uh, marrow edema. Uh, much better seen in this day and age with more modern imaging. Here's a kind of a next stage where we can actually see uh, a, a fracture line which goes in and there's de definite involvement of the overlying articular cartilage on one side, uh, which would be a stage two. Oops. Uh, here we can actually see an injury to the lateral Taylor dome, uh, kind of linear going down to, to both sides with some marrow edema underneath it, which was a uh, stage three. Uh, this is a major league baseball player where we can see an a, uh, area of subchondral fracture uh, with an in situ fragment. On the sagittal uh, PD fat set images, we can actually see a de depression of that fragment with a full thickness tear of the articular cartilage on one side. That would be kind of a, a type 2 lesions. In this particular patient, we could also see that there was a, a fracture of the anterior aspect of the tibial plafond. So this patient probably had a, a um, uh, significant subluxation at the time of the injury. And I think he caught it sliding into second base uh, was the cause of this. And this we also thought was a stage 3 lesion. Okay. Uh, let me see. I forgot who's name. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? Okay, so here we can see some subchondral depression and irregularity along the lateral aspect of the Taylor Dome. So this does look worrisome for an osteochondral lesion. Right, uh, with, a, uh, with a defect there, uh, and uh, there's a little bit of a uh, bone missing in that location. Good. Uh, see, Michael, what do you think of this case? All right, so there's a pretty large, uh, you know, osteochondral lesion of that medial Taylor dome. There doesn't look to be, you know, there's a little bit of uh, minimal depression. There doesn't look to be intact overlying cartilage. Right. So the could have been a surrounding lost. edema since this is yeah. We really have a defect in the bone here. You'd want to look for. But I don't, I don't see fluid undercutting it, and it's not displaced. 
Yeah, because you you don't have a bone. You don't have a bone here. This is just a big defect, a big cavity, where mm -hmm. the fluid from the joint space is going directly into the cavity with overlying uh, uh, grade four chondromalacia of the articular cartilage in this particular patient. So you'd look for loose bodies. Often they're not there, but sometimes they are. And we can see that there's probably some instability and trauma going on here because you have some edema in the subchondromal mm -hmm. associated with this. But this is probably an acute on top of chronic injury. They give the size. And in this particular case, if you look carefully, we actually found a loose body, a loose bony body uh, in the joint space. Again, a stage four type lesion. Okay, uh, Ashley, mm -hmm. what do you think of this? Can you go back to the last one? On the sagittal image, is that a loose body on the second? Over here? Uh, joint? No, no, no. Um, with it, right there, yeah. Yeah, I don't think that was the loose body. Okay. I would have to look at the other images because if you look at the loose body, I think it's it's down here on the medial side of the joint. Here's the lateral side. So the loose body ended up being over on another cut over on this side. Okay. Down here. The loose bodies, uh, they, they squirt out of the joint. They don't stay in a joint. Yeah. Uh, unless they're caught inside the lesion. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of this case, uh, Ashu? It looks like an osteochondral injury, medial tailored dome. Um, looks like there's a cystic change, focal cystic change in the expected region. And I think there's also overlying osteochondromalacia. Yeah, but, right. Um, so we've got severe hibernation of the bone here. This is all abnormal bone in through here. And then all these subchondral cystic changes, I agree with you. And this is really a chronic, more end-stage type lesion. Uh, right. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? Okay, so there's pretty much obliteration of that normal mortise along the lateral tibio-tailored joint. There's osseous remodeling and cyst formation and marrow edema. Um, it looks like just severe degenerative disease. It could be related to remote trauma. Yeah, so, so this is really end-stage disease. And you can see that there's mark remodeling of the tibial plafond. It should be flat across here. Uh, and if you also notice, you have impaction of the talus against the uh, fibula. So, so this is a patient who has valgus deformity of the heel and uh, has worn away the lateral aspect of the tibial plafond. So this is very chronic, longstanding uh, degenerative disease and instability of the uh, mortise joint with a big valgus deformity and all these cystic changes. Okay. Uh, all right, Michael, what do you think of this case? Uh, so it looks like this patient has had a ankle orthoplasty, which I don't know if I've actually seen before. Um, from what I can tell, the orthoplasty alignment may be okay. It looks like they have a chronic fracture deformity of that distal tibia. You know, there's a lot of or topic ossification. Um, I don't know, you know, I don't know too much about trying to evaluate ankle orthoplasties, to be honest. Um, and they're, they're the looking at it on the sagittals, like from what I can tell, it doesn't, I don't see any like gross abnormal malalignment, unless I'm missing something. I don't know if there's loosen, it doesn't really look like there's loosening around the hardware. Good. Can we go to the back to the sagittals? Yeah. What, what do you think caused the problem? Uh, I mean, this could be, you know, someone like the one we just saw in the prior exam. I mean, it looks like they had a prior, you know, fracture deformity, oh, and they probably had a, you know, severe post-traumatic degenerative changes of their ankle. You see all those holes? Uh, those, those are from uh, KY uh, and screws. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they probably had a, you know, pretty That's reconstructive. Probably a fracture, probably. Yeah. And as well, what you can also see here is some thinning of the uh, spacer here. In the oh, oh, yeah, I didn't realize these are two different dates. Yeah, two different dates. Yeah, so what you're trying to show me is how the, um, the uh, you have war, you know, you've worn down the, the spacer. Right. And you or can prosthesis, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, Ashu. 
Um, I'm not quite sure. I'm looking at here. It almost looks like there is fusion anteriorly between the the tibia and the tail and the talus. If that's yeah, if that's just a metallic artifact. More. Well, My question is, if it looks like, what do you think? <laughs> Yeah, it, lo it looks like fusion, um, probably post-traumatic fusion, but... Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I think this patient had surgery. It's interesting, it fused in the flex position here. J John, what position do you normally try to fuse the, the mortise joint in? Um, normal position, 90 degrees. Yeah, this is plantar flexed here. Yeah, you might want to plan or flex a female a little bit, okay. but not by much. All right. Okay, and then here we can see another mortise joint fusion. This is post-surgical mortise joint fusion. Is, do you do you fuse it more flex for females because of the the footwear? Um, high higher heels can be used. Um, if you plan to flex the foot a little bit, okay. uh, ladies like to wear a little elevation on the heels so their calves look nicer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so the guys chase them more. And they don't have to chase very hard when somebody has a problem like this. <laughs> uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? Okay, so here we can see that there's an edematous stata process. It looks like there may be a coronally oriented fracture through the stata process with surrounding soft tissue edema and fluid. So probably also some edema in the posterior superior calcaneus and posterior tibia. So I guess I'm not sure if the mechanism of injury would be like a hyperflexion injury, but... I think hyperplant reflection, right. Good. Okay. Uh, let's see. So here we can uh, see a, this is a distal calcaneal fracture there, which we can see right here is involving the anterior process of the calcaneus. Okay. Uh, Michael. Okay, so um, there's a lot of edema in that distal calcaneus um, with a separated bony fragment of that anterior calcaneus. Um, so it looks like it's just like a displaced fracture. And unlike the other one, I don't think there's coalition here. Good. Okay. Could that be a, a symptomatic os calcaneus secundarius? Yeah, I, I think those are fractures, but. I, we see the, uh, the changes in the uh, cancellous bone. It, 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 it looks like uh, uh, a, a definite fracture. Yeah. Don't you think so? Yes, uh, I, I would call this a fracture of the anterior process, not a, an edematous symptomatic os, but yeah. there, there may not be any real difference between those two statements. If it was um, something else, it, it'd be fibrous, fibrous fusion, but it looks like a flip fracture. Yeah, I think that was a fracture. Acute. Uh, yes. Ashu, what do you think of this case? Um, there's some boning remodeling uh, along the posterior talus and uh, some marrow edema there. And there's a pretty big os trigonum, uh, big posterior subtalar joint effusion. I don't know if we'd be worried about, okay, so subtalar uh, degenerative joint disease and, yeah, and, and this posterior all, impingement. Yeah, yeah this is post-traumatic from a previous fracture of the compression fracture of the talus. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer. Okay, so here it looks like there is fibrocartilaginous coalition between the calcaneus and the talus. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't see any definite 
osseous bridging, but they're surrounding degenerative disease. So it's most likely fibrocartilaginous coalition of that medial subtalar facet. Good. That's exactly right. And notice it's very typical that these are in an oblique fashion. The normal uh, joint space should be horizontal to the ground. And this oblique is, uh, is abnormal and causes abnormal stress patterns uh, within the ankle. So that's fibrous coalition. Okay, uh, Michael. Okay, so, you know, we have some abnormality in that distal tibia on the sagittal stir sequence. We see this kind of serpiginous, um, you know, bright signal with, you know, normal kind of marrow centrally. And it's a little more conspicuous on the other, I think that's, I don't know, T1 or GRE image. Um, this is T1. This is a T1. Yeah. This is stir. Uh, do we have any other? So first thing when I just see this is like, I'm like, oh, is there like a bone infarct? Um, but yeah. So and this is lupus, so it's probably a bone infarct secondary to lupus itself or the steroids used? Yeah, it's, it's probably due to lupus itself. Uh, I, I think the abnormalities you get with steroids for chronic steroids, uh, which we've always called osteonecrosis in the past, you know, they can be osteonecrosis, but a lot of those are actually uh, stress, trabecular stress fractures uh, due to the weakening of the bone from chronic steroid use. Okay, and then here we can see the central uh, bone infarct in this patient with lupus. Uh, Ashu. Um, it's kind of similar appearance, serpentin serpentinous uh, bone yeah. infarcts, the distal tibia, this and also maybe scanner. also in the tail. The other one was low field. And here we can see many bones involved. Uh, and these are also bone infarcts, very characteristic of lupus. You can also see this in uh, sickle cell disease. Okay, uh, Jennifer. This is the case okay, that so always drives John crazy. <laughs> this is, um, there are post-surgical changes along the medial aspect of the Taylor dome as well as along the subtalar joint. Yeah. I believe this is a this fusion is actually, of the subtalar right. joint. This is actually a fracture here, an acute fracture in this particular patient. And this is a device used to try to fuse the subtalar joint space. Uh, that was an attempt at fusion. It doesn't look fused to me. No, it doesn't look fused to me either. Uh, uh, these these don't work too good. Yeah, Michael, what do you think of this one? Okay, so there's a I guess arthrodesis screw going from like anterior, posterior, inferiorly from the through the talus to the calcaneus. This, Another try subtalar joint effusion. At least on MRI, I don't see any bony bridging at this time. Yeah, this patient they had to remove the screw for because of. Oh, is that just a screw track left? Screw track, right? Yeah, I see that now because it's not really a metallic artifact. And and going through it, we didn't see any areas of actual bone fusion. Right. One of the problems with this particular fusion is infection, and it's very difficult to deal with. Uh, so if there's some other way to do it, um, and there is, uh, that's what I would do. Um, go to the joint um, uh, and uh, put bone and uh, autogenous bone into the uh, joint and, and, and fuse it that way, not, not with a screw. Okay, good. Oh, that's, uh, that fixation is good, um, but uh, the problem is it, 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 it's a bad area to, to go uh, putting a screw through. Uh, infections are quite common. Okay, thanks, John. Ashley, what do you think of this case? Well, almost looks like a vertically oriented talus. The navicular is also kind of inferiorly subluxed. I don't see significant decreased marrow edema. Um, this looks like an old dislocation. 
Um, yeah, it's, it's it's really at the navicular cuneiform uh, plane here, and you have right a vertical talus, a dorsal d dislocation of the mid and distal foot, and uh, we can also see a lot of rotation here in the talus and the navicular. Uh, that could be from birth. Uh, as a congenital flat foot from a vertical talus, this may, may not be traumatic. Uh, I think in this particular case, John, there was a history of trauma. Well, there was. Right. Because I've seen uh, uh, three or four vertical tali in my my career. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and 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 they should be treated uh, in infancy just like uh, all feet okay but that's the way it goes yeah uh, it, it's interesting how that was dislocated and not treated yeah right uh jennifer what do you think of this case <clears throat> okay so here it looks like there's complete disloc dislocation of the talus. The tibia abuts the calcaneus. Um, and I'm not sure where the rest of the talus is, if it's displaced medially or laterally. Yeah, this uh, the, the rest of the talus is in the surgeon's bucket. Uh, this was uh, trauma, and they went in and, and resected part of the, the, the body of the talus but uh, they didn't fuse anything. And this patient had persistent pain, and you can see a lot of persistent bone marrow edema due to- Is there a little uh, missing calcaneus too? There may well be a little bit of missing calcaneus here as well. I'll, get, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a short story. That surgeon was working on a dislocated talus, uh, and that was the only injury that that was seen at that time. This was before MRI and CT. And uh, he made the incision and, and uh, was putting the talus back in place and it squirted out of his hand and fell on the floor. So they wash, wash, washed it up, yep. uh, washed it real good with surgical soap and uh, and put it back in a, where it belonged. Oh my God! And apparently, it turned out okay. Wow. Oh my God! <laughs> An unusual event. Right. How well uh, it, it turned out, I really don't know. But they said that it would turned out okay, whatever that means. Amazing! Wow. Uh, let's see. I forgot who's next. Who is last? I think I'm next. Okay. 74-year-old with pain and swelling after a sialistic implant. It looks like the implant's fractured, yeah. um, and there's a frank dislocation, and there's a lot of fluid along the plantar surface. Yeah. <clears throat> um, quite a bit of fluid, um, and um, it looks like a fracture there. Yeah. So this was a uh, this was a fractured. So elastic implant with a lot of uh, associated synovitis. I worked with a surgeon uh, who did, did um, rheumatoid arthritis and arthritis in general. Uh, I, I taught him how to do the hip, yeah, total hip, and he taught me how to do a total knee. Hmm. Um, anyway, um, this was in the 70s, and um, I, I think we, we put in hundreds of scholastic prostheses and they lasted about a year. Yeah. Uh, we used the scholastic in hands and feet and I, I um, can't imagine how many of those he had to take out. I wasn't there to take them out, so. Wow. Yeah, I've seen a lot of problems. I haven't seen any, seen any of them recently, so. Um, uh, his book is on a shelf uh, if you want to look at it. Good, thank you. Yep, I know where it is. Uh, Jennifer. Okay, um, so 
here we're looking at the level of the proximal metatarsals or TMT joints. There's cyst formation in that first and metatarsal with a lot of fluid and edema between the metatarsals. I, this could be infectious, such as like a bursitis, or it could be injury of the inner metatarsal ligament. And here we see degenerative disease of that TMT joint with cyst formation and osseous erosion and some loose bodies along the superior joint space. Um, there is some lateral subluxation of that second metatarsal base relative to the cuneiforms. So this is most likely a chronic Liz Frank injury with degenerative disease or Charcot disease. Yeah, yeah. The 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 list frame is in a different. John, wouldn't you want to see more fragmentation if it's a Charco joint? Uh, well, uh, I, I think it's you certainly can see fragmentation Charco joint, but uh, before you see fragmentation, what you get is a lot of hibernation and thickening of, of the edges of the bone. You see a lot of evidence of instability in this. Uh, subchond subchondral cystic changes as we're seeing here and then you can start seeing displacement as the ligaments uh, tear which uh, occurred in, in this location <laughs> and uh, uh, later on it can go on to to frank uh, uh, a lot of fractures and so forth but but this is a typical appearance of uh, kind of an intermediate Charcot disease because it involves a huge number of joints typically involving the midfoot. And uh, what separates this from, usually what we're doing, these are in, usually in diabetic patients, and you're trying to differentiate between whether you've got a Charcot disease from repetitive trauma versus osteomyelitis. So what you then look for to see if there are any soft tissue abscesses, which in a lot of these chronic patients with di uh, diabetes, when you get, uh, Oste osteomyelitis, you'll have a lot of soft tissue abscesses. And, and then you look, when you see sharply defined subchondral cysts like this, that's not, they're, they're not due to osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis does not have sharp margins like this, uh, but uh, this, this kind of very dark, sharp marginated lesions within the bone are typical of Charcot disease, and, and this patient does not have evidence of osteomyelitis. Yeah, well, the th first thing you'd look for is pus, um, and um, here you have a separation of the second and, well, first and second. Frank's, uh, type of a problem like uh, Jennifer mentioned. Right. Yeah, Liz Frank. Yeah, certainly the Liz Frank ligament is, is torn, but, but this is really very uh, chronic disease, uh, <clears throat> and uh, with a lot more involved than, than just the area of the list, Frank. This is. Yeah, I would. Uh, if there was an infection, I think there'd be a lot more fuss. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, Michael. All right. So chronic diabetic with pain. Um, so we're you're showing me a sagittal MRI, kind of centered at the. Uh, I believe this is probably the first TMT joint. It's one of the TM TMT joints, and there's a lot of marrow edema and kind of subchondral cystic uh, change yeah. in that uh, metatarsal base. Okay, sir. Um, okay, right. You know, we don't see, like, you know, this isn't, you know, I'm wondering if there's some, you know, this is kind of the area you might see some neuropathic type joint. I don't see, you're not showing me like ulceration on the skin or something. So I don't think this is osteo unless we're, yeah. we have other clues into it. So it's probably just neuropathic. Yeah. So this is another typical Charcot disease. And the, the Charcot disease typically is in this, in, in this area uh, where you're talking about really the metatarsal tarsal articulation is the common location for, uh, for, for disease. And here are just other examples where we can see, again, these sharply defined areas of cystic change and, and uh, marrow demon hibernation and uh, thickening of the bone, typical of Charcot disease. Here's someone who had a PET scan, uh, and you could just see the areas that lit up uh, on the PET scan. 
uh, where you have uh, degenerative joint disease. Okay, uh, Hashi, what do you think of this case? Mm, um, 55 year old male with foot pain. I'm not sure what I'm looking at here. It looks like there's a lot of skin thickening along the plantar surface. Um, it looks like there's chronic fractures, uh, the second and third metatarsal, um, and a frank dislocation uh, on the sagittal, uh, the tarsal metatarsal joints. So, yeah, this is an old fracture dislocation that wasn't treated. Why do you think that there's a the second metatarsal is always in trouble. I'm not asking. I'm not asking you, John. I'm asking. <laughs> is it because uh, the lysmic ligament keeps the base stabilized, and then? I'll try, try again. I guess the longest metatarsal you have. Oh, okay. It's the longest metatarsal. Okay. Uh, very simple. I'm a, I'm a simple guy. <laughs> okay, well, uh, why don't we stop here and we'll move on to inflammatory disease of the foot and ankle uh, on Thursday. Any questions?